I decided to dive in um, and experience what it really feels like to be one of our prepared speakers. Um, I hate suffering. And I don't just mean the concept of it or the injustice of it. I literally mean the confrontation of it. I figure out a way to avoid it as much as possible. I've never seen, I've never seen Schindler's List. And I've walked out of movies where something happens that is so cruel from one person to another that I just can't stand it. I have no idea how you guys like Fargo. Like, why that movie makes sense to you, I have no idea. And I've never seen the end of Pulp Fiction. I dashed out halfway through. It also means that I've ducked out of trips to India, one of which was actually with Ted a couple of years ago. I came so close, but I just couldn't imagine what it would feel like when I got off that plane. And it also means that I've not spent any time volunteering for a cause that probably is the nearest and dearest to my heart, and that is the abuse and neglect of children and all the work that CASA and some really phenomenal organizations in town do. I just can't imagine again what it would feel like to be in that spot. It's because the gap between pain and suffering and the potential is so great, and that spread is so impossible for me to be able to suffer that I just can't stand it. It is excruciating, and I stay away from it. It also meant that then, as I was looking at career choices, social work was probably not going to be the place that I was going. Um, I'm very, again, uh, impressed and proud of the folks that do it. Ugh. I'm Italian. Um, uh, but the folks who do that work, obviously, it's so impressive, but I decided that business was for me. And so first I tried banking, and then I tried uh, industrial psychology, and thank God I found advertising, and that whole community of people who are so creative and expressive. Um, and eventually it turned into strategy and brand strategy, and more and more increasingly it is uh, strategic transformation. I alluded to it a little bit at the beginning, but this idea, again, that we're shifting from one way of doing business to another, and this sort of... Uh, consideration and thoughtfulness that goes into understanding what it is the future needs from us and how we can contribute to it. And ironically, I'm staring suffering back in its face. And this time, I can't just turn away, right? This is what I do for a living. And so again, I feel this incredible pain between the gap, or, the, or that gap, uh, and the pain that's causing that gap between pain and potential. Now, I can go to all these companies, and I can lay out, actually, probably a pretty extraordinary future for many of them, as many of my colleagues do. Um, some of my friends are here who do the same kind of work that I do, right? And we actually can give them the plan, and we can talk to these leaders, and we can show them what the potential is, and they still don't do it. You know what that feels like, right? Organizations are in turmoil, the falling stock price, scared employees, and the biggest, biggest one for me is missed opportunities. Right? There's something that's right there that they could grab and they don't see it. And again, I think about why. We see teams mired in bureaucracy. We see people strangled by legacy systems and poor decision making. And really they're chained to this need to be sure, right? To be right. Have you guys worked for any companies that feel like that? <laughs> um, at the same time that all that's going on, as Jeff alluded to and some others in their talks, we're asking teams and leaders to be much more collaborative, nimble, entrepreneurial, adaptive, dynamic, right? All those words, we heard those words, authentic, transparent. And yet we're giving them no systems to support this, no vision to guide them, and no faith that they can actually do it. Iconic brands are losing their, and I say brands, but I can say organizations, I can say leaders, because they're terrified of losing what it is that they currently have and they're completely isolated from a larger ecosystem that they could actually tap into for support and for encouragement for ideas. I guess at the end of the day, the part that I am most pained by is that I see wasted potential in the people, the ideas, and the earned equity that these brands and these organizations have earned, right? And that have the potential to release, and most importantly, to contribute to all the rest of us. They actually have a really deep purpose that is invisible to them, and they cannot get out of their own way to see it. Now, this isn't just the case of one struggling brand, BlackBerry, um, or one wayward company or one wayward leader, right? These days we see it in every single sector. As a person who scans business and scans culture, you see everything from healthcare to education to aerospace to, uh, to every form of business, right? The food industry, the music industry, the publishing industry, I could go on and on and on. Every one of them is trying to reinvent what it is that they're supposed to be as this future moves forward. And as a result, we also then see every team, every leader, every individual faced with this question about what it is that they're supposed to be and how they're supposed to change and adapt. We heard a lot of people talk today about how they left corporate world to find their purpose. I beg for you in corporate world to stay in it 
and contribute your purpose, right? The problem is we often don't know how to do it. We're petrified of failure and showing any weakness. We don't know where to begin often, right? We, if we tap others and we say, hey, I need some help, it admits that we don't know. And all that imposter stuff comes roaring back about whether or not we should actually have this position of leadership or contribution in some way. And that scares the hell out of us. And yet, with all the work that needs to be done, people, we can't afford to be in that space. You know, We need to build and rebuild solutions and invent new ways of doing things. Um, that old way of kind of clinging to the past and thinking that I can just sort of duck and not do it is just not going to cut it. And I also will tell you that the people who are out there making all that stuff happen need you. They're getting tired. They cannot do it alone anymore. We need everybody in it. It's the time to be brave and bold and brilliant as we open this day with. Now, gratefully, as I sat in this like, quandary, and people who've known me and know what I do for a living have seen me stumble a little bit in this in the last year or two, um, I was invited to do a consulting project with a philanthropy, a, a non-paid gig. Um, with a great global group in New York that actually has taken on changing the way the world tackles poverty. They're literally creating a world without poverty. Okay, it doesn't get any bigger than that in my world. I mean, that is looking at suffering straight in its face, right? They go around the world and really try and work on that. They're pioneers in the world of social innovation, and we're really taking stock now at their 10th anniversary about what they had to offer, what the future needed from them, and what they were in a unique position to create. And I do that for a living, so I was like, great, I will offer all my expertise to you. What I didn't realize was that what I was going to get given back from them. The name of the organization is Acumen. It's run by a phenomenal and very visionary woman named Jacqueline Novogratz. And she's built the organization on a set of paradoxic principles. So the idea that we need to be listeners and leaders. That we need to be offering generosity, but hold people accountable. And the most amazing one to me is that we need to really serve in humility and stretch for the audacious. I was like, humility and audacity. How do those two things work together? And I spun them around for a while in my head. And I was really, really intrigued by this idea. And I kind of came up with this idea. This, of course, I have to turn everything into some sort of noun um, of humble audacity. Cool word, isn't it? Kind of a cool concept. You've actually seen, you've heard, you've heard examples of it throughout the day. And it'd be interesting if you guys and I agree on which ones those are, but there are already moments in which this has happened. The idea is, and I'm sure we could dig into understanding all that it means, but for me, I'm going to say it means that we don't have all the answers going in, right? That actually it's more important to presume that we don't have the answers going in. That's the only way you can truly listen to something. And in doing so, then we also can release ourselves from having the solution. There isn't just one solution, and it isn't just yours. It also means that we can look at a place from not just about what we can extract and what we can protect, but what it is that we can contribute. You can make the exact same widget, folks, but it's about the intent in which you make that widget, right? If you believe that that widget can actually offer purpose and meaning to others, it changes the game completely, and all those things that you are scared about go away. You are desperate then to collaborate with others because you want that mission to be fulfilled. And actually, you don't even have to create your own thing. You can join the work of others. How's that? We don't have to continually reinvent the wheel. We can actually now, in a place of more humble service, join the work that is others. I think for me, the thing that has been, there's a lot of eye-opening moments as I've like played around with that concept and tried to practice it more. Um, I'll just say a couple of things that I've learned from it. One is that I am now less um, frustrated when I go into a situation like that. I have so much more empathy for the folks that are in it, and I have a real desire to want to try and relieve the fear that they're in. And I think part of it is now because progress isn't a reflection of whether or not I showed up with enough. Progress is actually now measured by how much I was willing to listen. And that is actually a whole lot easier to practice. So I'll just submit to all of us that this matters more than you can ever imagine, because again, we're in this point of complete inflection. And as I spend my time thinking about my work and what I do, there's a couple of questions that I ask over and over myself and to others. What does the future need and expect from us? What are we each in a unique position to create and to contribute? And if we were willing to do it with a sense of humble audacity, how much suffering could we each alleviate for ourselves and for everyone else? Thank you.